This is the eight limbs of yoga explained. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm Anthony Samroff, author of the book Procrastination Annihilation, which you can download from beyourselfandloveit.com forward slash do it. Okay, I wanted to do a video after a conversation I had in the pub with a friend of mine where he was talking about the eight limbs of yoga. And I wanted to do a video explaining them. Why? Well, what's the point in that? Well, in the West, we tend to think of yoga as postures, getting into positions, stretching, might um, improve your posture, your um, flexibility, your fitness, your strength. However, that is only one small part of yoga. There's actually eight aspects to yoga as it was put forward by a dude called Patanjali. That's how he explained it. And we're going to speak a little bit about him in a minute. So why should this be of interest to you if you're not interested in stretching? Well, as I said, that's only one small part of yoga. Yoga is actually, yoga means union. That There's two elements to that, I, the way that I see it. One is union, connection with yourself, and through that connection with everything, connection with your environment. If you feel connected to yourself, you will easily feel a sense of ease in the world and a sense of union and connection with your environment. And obviously there's a spiritual ele element to that, but you don't have to accept the spiritual element of that to see the benefit of it. So yoga is actually a complete system. It's not just about building up your body. It's a complete system for self-perfection. Now, what do you mean by that, Anthony? I mean, no one's perfect. Okay, yeah, that's. let's not get pedantic here. I don't mean, uh, it's true that no one's perfect. However, you have certain capacities. You have a mind, a body, emotions, you have energies, and yoga is a system for perfecting your body, that's where the stretching and things like that come in and your mind and um, so that you're not full of uh, unpleasant emotions and your soul if you believe that you have one. So um, to bring them to their fullest capacity, let's say, rather than to perfect them. So that's why you might be interested in it, particularly if you've got an undue amount of suffering in your life and may be of interest to you. Um, well, it's interesting to me. So let me see if I can figure out how to use this to share my screen because I've not done this Facebook before. Does anyone know? Uh, hmm. Don't worry, I'll be worth it. Hmm. Guess I should have done a test run if I wanted to do something I hadn't done before. I'm just wetting your appetite for more keeping you in suspense. Nope, I don't know how to do it. Okay, well that's a shame because I had uh, uh, presented some slides. So the eight limbs of yoga uh, start with a dude called Patanjali. He was like the first person to formally systematize yoga and t try and make a scientific um, delivery of the core principles and messages in a sequential way so people could follow it like a formula. Now he's not the originator of yoga. Yoga predates Patanjali by hundreds if not thousands of years. Legend has it that Shiva, you've all seen the Hindu god Shiva, legend has it that he was the first person to teach yoga to the world and that um, he on this planet. Now we don't really know if Shiva actually existed or he's just a mythical creature, um, but if he did exist, he's the first person to bring yoga to this planet. So we don't know if he really existed and maybe he was a person, maybe he was an extraterrestrial or maybe he was some kind of angel or God according to the legend. But essentially what he did was he, um, before they say before he was, he came to earth that men, human beings were more like um, in a more animalistic state and he brought yoga to the planet. So we're gonna go through the eight limbs of yoga. Okay, the first one is what we call yamas and or discipline. So so yamas, the, the, I'm gonna go through four, five yamas. <laughs> and we're gonna do yama, and then niyama, 
and that well that's not one of the five that's the next one then we're going to talk about asanas which are the positions you've already heard of and then we're going to talk about a few more things so discipline is the first limb of yoga and there's some specific ones that they talk about and we are not going to uh, some people have different ones but these are the five that i was taught the first one is ahimsa or non-violence the discipline of being non-violent and that's in your thoughts your words and in your actions and people who take this very seriously would tend to be vegetarians as well because they don't want to inflict violence on animals the second uh, yama is uh, truthfulness so you pretty much self explanatory you don't go around lying and telling falsehoods that will corrupt you as a human being as well as get you into messes later on that you will regret the third one is non-stealing so that's the third discipline you don't nick people's stuff very libertarian principle those who know me from my other videos the fourth being non-possessiveness or um, hoarding or collecting so not to be too materialistic and keep on to stuff that you don't necessarily need and um, again these are this is not a moralization the system of yoga says that this is for your own benefit so it's not not, it's not an immoralistic way of saying oh you should all that stuff it's more it's not to your benefit to hold on to things you don't need it's a bad habit it's not going to serve you and the fifth one being brahmacharya and um, now a lot of people think that brahmacharya means literally celibacy but it actually means just means like uh, respectful control of your sexuality your sexual energy and um, not being too promiscuous not very good for me um not my favorite not my favorite yeah and um, but people who take so it's like not to um, be disrespectful of your sexual energy and people who are really serious about yoga and they take it seriously and um, will actually only have sex three days out of the month if they're a woman at a certain period in their menstrual cycle there's three days where it's appropriate for them to have sex and if they're a man then they wait for those three days in their women's menstrual cycle but that's for people who take it really seriously and the idea of that is they don't want to be throwing out, out their energy having sex they want to do what they consider to be more constructive things send it up and uh, send it upwards from send the energy upwards up through their body and um, to make them strong and compassionate and wise and they believe in the yogic system that you can use your sexual sexual energy to do to do that the second part of yoga is niyamas so um th these are more universal rules they're um kind of uh, they're they're stated positive kind of obligations it's not to say like this like if this this is if that's not your you don't say it, well that's not my culture it doesn't apply to me they're like things that they kind of promote um for your own benefit so the first one is like cleanliness and that's not just of body but like internal so you, you don't keep a dirty mind oh man i'm disqualified from yoga no i don't i mean you know um how can i put that better i don't mean dirty mind i just mean like not harboring bad thoughts and um grudges and things but they also clean all sorts of parts of their body the inside of their nostrils so they can breathe better ears and um, obviously the target areas of under your arms and your crotch but um yeah to be clean the second one is kind of like uh called santosha or contentment it means being fulfilled and having gratitude and satisfaction with what you've had so it's the the practice of uh, being thankful and satisfied with what you have the third one is austerity or tapa and it means um yeah to to uh, to make yourself durable to um and capable and uh, uh practice you know t temperance so and the, the fourth one is self-study and the fifth one is surrender so you whatever your life circumstances if you can change them for the better you do what you can to change them for the better and if you can't change them then you accept life as it is and you and that you know that that principle obviously went forward into buddhism the buddha if um was a hindu before he became the buddha of course so and he learned from all sorts of teachers so um that became a big feature of buddhism the idea of self-surrender 
surrendering your ego and taking life as it comes. I should say, uh, before we go on to the third one, which is the asanas, the positions that, you've, that you're almost familiar with, you tend to equate yoga with. Um, so there's like, you. what's the point, right? Do you believe in enlightenment? It doesn't really matter if you do or not. Uh, I've never experienced it before, at least not that I remember, maybe in a past life. Um, but the, the, the idea of yoga is ultimately it's a path from the kind of suffering you're experiencing now to enlightenment. The, the, the levels of, but it's a formulaic, it's, um, it's a formula. If you do X, you will get Y. So we're about to talk about the asanas, the positions. What is the point in all the stretching? What is the point in putting your body in these positions? Well, the idea is by putting your body in these positions, you're, um, you, it will have certain effects on your health, on your psyche, on your emotionality. It's going to improve you and it's going to stop your body from being an impediment to you. You know, they, they identified in yoga um, 84 yoga asanas. So an asana is a position. There's literally thousands, hundreds of thousands, infinite positions that you can put your body in. But there's 84 yoga asanas, yoga asanas, ones that are designed to um, and put your mind and your emotions in a certain state as you build up the capacity to put yourself in those positions. And the idea is, hey, if you can hold your body in all 84 of these positions, the rest of life will be a complete piece of cake. This isn't going to get in your way. This is, you know, you're strong, you're supple, you're fit. You can, you uh, anything you want to do is not going to be a problem for you. And they say you can do that as long as you've not got serious problems with your body. If you're really serious about it, they say that you could actually manage to do that in 180 days. I don't think I'd manage to do it in 180 days. That'd probably take a serious amount of focus. So that this yoga is a formula for creating effortlessness in your life and uh, making life not a uh, menace or nonsense to you. And you can contrast it with, say, as an approach to enlightenment, if you believe that that exists, you can contrast it to the Zen approach, which isn't about gradually building yourself up. Zen believes that you can instantly get enlightened if the right combination of experiences happen to you. You might have seen a guy on YouTube or read his books uh, called Eckhart Tolle, he, Tolle, Eckhart Tolle, he claims that he just instantly became enlightened. At one point, the suffering in his life became too much and he noticed a split in his mind be between his ego, um, which was everything he thought he was, all his conceptualization, and the part of himself that was watching. And as soon as that split was made between um, his ego and the part that was watching, um, he just felt contentment because he wasn't getting involved in his own drama that's kind of more like a zen approach to enlightenment boom it happens in a bang suddenly you're there a couple of people claim that it's happened to them so yoga is not like that yoga is like a gradual build up it's the, the idea is that you can become gradually build up to a state where life is so effortless that this this distance between your mind and everything you're perceiving is created, is cultivated gradually, so that the, the goal is in the end, whatever's happening, whatever's going on in your mind, whatever nonsense is happening outside, challenging, easy, whatever it is, you're just observing it. And then you can, because you're not emotionally involved in it, you can take effective action to get the results that you want in your life. So that's part of the purpose of this practice, the, the practice of yoga. It would have been good if I explained that at the beginning, but I only thought to do it now. So back to the positions. Okay, so we've said if you can get into these 84 positions, the rest of life will be a piece of cake. If you want to lift things up the stairs or load them into the car or run for a bus, it's, it's not going to put you out of breath. Um, you're not going to have any trouble getting off the toilet seat when you're old, that's for sure. And the, the purpose of the asanas, the third limb of yoga, the only one that people here seem to know about, is to make the body steady and comfortable. And um, if your body's not stable, then your energy can't be stable. And if your energy's not stable, your mind can't be stable. So again, they say 
it takes 90 days for the body to become stable and that would probably be practicing yoga twice a day. I had some serious problems with my body so I'm way behind and I still don't think I'm quite near that level of stability yet but I hope to go back to India and do some more yoga in good time. So uh, 180 days I've heard it said you should if you're really, really serious and you're practicing every day, you might be able to get into all those positions. So it's not a whole lifetime, but you can spend a lifetime doing it. Some people, when they're young and they're bought, brought up in this culture, they do hours of getting in positions when they're young. And then later on in their life, they maybe just do 20 minutes every couple of days just to keep topped up. And um, there comes to a point where you've got that stability and then all you need is maintenance. And that just depends on how much time you invest in doing it. And um, also, uh, the other thing I should add is if you're not comfortable, you can't meditate or at least it becomes very hard to meditate. So asana was largely pre uh, preparation for the practice of meditation to prepare the body to sit nice and still and comfortably. We've lost the ability, myself included, to sit still and be comfortable in the West. But um, this is to prepare you for that. The fourth limb of yoga, pranayama. Now be, you may remember from the beginning that yama means discipline. We talked about the five yamas and the five niyamas. Well, pranayama, prana, you might have heard some new agers go on about their prana. I'm going to raise my pranic energy. Well, that's kind of like your life force, your energy. So it's the discipline of your energy. But we practice that by, by doing breathing exercises. So when people practice pranayama, they will typically be doing breathing exercises. One of the most famous ones is called Anulom Vilom, which is you breathe out your left nostril, then you breathe in your left nostril, then out your right nostril, then in your right nostril, out your left, and you just keep on crossing over. And if you do that for four to eight minutes already, you'll seem, seem to get a sense of balance in the body. It's very subtle. So the reason why we use our breath is because um, the breath is kind of a turning point. Like you've got all of these um, features of your physiology, like your circulatory system, uh, your heartbeat, they're completely automatic. And then you've got things that we do consciously, like move our body. Well, our breath, we can control our breath, but we can also, if we forget about our breath, we continue to breathe, we don't stop. So it's really seen as a pivot, which is why a lot of meditative practices get you to focus on your breath or do breathing exercises. And why in pranayama, you start with a whole load of different breathing exercises to help bring balance to your system. Because, you know, think about your system, think about a ladder, right? If you've got a shaky ladder, you're not going to want to go climb very high in the ladder. But if you've got a nice solid base, a nice solid foundation, you can build up high. And if you've got a nice steady ladder, you can climb up high. So the pranayama, the discipline of your energy is all about, um, creating stability in your system. And we start that using the breath. And there's people, probably people who are very advanced yogis, probably don't need to use even use their breath. If they really know what they're doing, they probably go into far more advanced position, uh, uh, exercises or practices for the control of their system, for the control of their energy. But the breath is definitely the um, entry point. And that's, that's, if you went to learn pranayama in India, they teach you some breathing exercises. So let's see, there's uh, what, um, I'm just going to see if there's anything I want to add about pranayama. We go on to the next one. Okay, we're going to go on to the fifth limb of yoga, pratyahara. Okay, pratyahara means withdrawal of the senses. Now there's two schools of thought in this. You've probably heard of people going, off to a temple or a monastery where they um, don't listen to any music or or go on the internet or read the newspaper. They might be even more austere than that. They might be instructed not to um, take aesthetic pleasure in things, you know, just to focus on themselves. Uh, certainly no sex, um, that's for sure. And withdrawal of the senses is to look inside. Now the school of thought that I'm from uh, it says don't do that because um, what will happen is you want to do all that stuff 
but you just deprive your you want to eat night whatever kind of food you want and things like that but you just you're just uh, repressing the desire and anything that you suppress uh, will become more powerful and end up controlling you you know it's like when people try and do those low low carb diets and finally they go crazy and just eat the worst carbs ever so because they, they suppress the desire and suppress the desire so one uh, school of thought is to go and deliberately practice pratyahara the withdrawal of the senses and focus inwardly and um, and you can and and you can of course do that as a retreat do that as a but but my uh, school of thought says do not do that as a way of life because that's just uh, maybe as a retreat but not as a way of life because that's repression what you want to do is you want to practice pranayama and the yamas and niyamas and asanas and as a consequence of your spiritual practice as a consequence of particularly pranayama but also the other stuff you'll naturally uh, begin to practice pratyahara you just you just won't be interested in the things you used to be interested in you just won't feel like watching tv or spending hours on youtube you'll just feel like sitting meditating looking inside you'll feel like journaling because it arises naturally out of the practice of pranayama okay the next one dharana okay concentration now a lot of people dharana a lot of people think this is in the west think this is meditation um actually this is kind of like the starting point so um you learn to concentrate you learn to for your mind not to wander around. I've got a very wandering mind. I would like to get some better dharana in my life. So th that this is this is just you can practice concentration, which brings us on to the seventh um, limb of yoga, which is dhyana, or as we would understand it, meditativeness. Meditativeness. Okay. Now, in the West, we use the word meditation it just means anything. If people focus on their breath, we call it meditation. If they're just quiet, we call it meditation. There's transcendental meditation. There's all sorts of Vipassana, all sorts. Okay, that's too broad a word. Uh, that's not the case, obviously, in the, in the yogic system. They have all sorts of words to describe all sorts of practices. But a meditativeness is just um, a quality of calm observation and being in the present moment and mindfulness as we we ironically call it in the west because it has very little to do with the mind the less you're focused on your mind and the more you're focused on the object of your attention whether that's internal or it's external if you're concentrating on something the more mindful you are the more you're the more you're observing something the more mindful you are which means the less you're thinking because the more mindful you are you don't really have time to think so the idea in the yogic system is you can't actually practice meditation you say oh i've got a meditative practice no you're sitting down and you're hoping that meditation will happen you're creating space for meditation to happen and the more you sit down and you learn to relax and you learn to watch your breath or observe the sensations in your body whatever your practice is you hope that the more you do that the better your concentration will become and finally a meditativeness will arise out of that concentration and that's called dhyana so in the yogic system you practice dharana the sixth limb which is concentration you practice that in the hope of being able to achieve dhyana which is meditativeness and out of dhyana comes out of meditativeness comes the eighth limb of yoga which is samadhi which is a state of blissfulness mm, i'd like some of that in my life in some so you get a state now out of your meditativeness you can reach a state of blissfulness and it says that part of the you know how i was saying earlier on that part of the purpose of the asanas is to prepare your body to meditate so so that you can sit down and, and comfortably in the same position they say in the yogic system that if you're able to sit down in the same position for three hours and 45 minutes without moving just comfortable three hours and boom you get samadhi you go straight into a state of blissfulness if you're able to train your body to be completely still 
in three hours and 45 minutes, boom, you're there. So I'm guessing it's, I've never experienced it before. I'm guessing uh, like many states, it's a sense of um, finding the coordinates, finding how to feel that way. And probably the more times you've experienced it, the more easily you'll go into that state of blissfulness. So for people who've um, been practicing a long time and have experienced that state of blissfulness many times, uh, they probably find it easier to access that state. For us who are just beginning on our journey, well, I guess we'll just have to keep plugging away. Now, if you want to put me in a state of blissfulness, you can do that by sharing this video on your wall, share it, send it in a message to anyone who you think might be interested in this or might benefit from it. And uh, let's see if we can get some comments and find out what people think and what they want me to make videos on in the future. Uh, I've really enjoyed this. I've built up to it for a while um, and I'm glad that I actually did it. So please, I've taken 26 minutes here. It would be really great if you took a few minutes to share it around. Thank you very much. And you can find me on YouTube. Oh yeah, and don't forget to download my free book, Procrastination Annihilation, from beyourselfandloveit.com forward slash do it. Until then, I wish you some Maddie.